a big picture about how different parts of the brain interact with each other to generate coherent behaviors during courtship and aggression. Um, and specifically, uh, the, uh, the flexible, the cognitive aspect of the behavior, um, we still don't know exactly uh, what is the neural mechanisms for that. And that's something that uh, my lab uh, is particularly interested in. So valence and arousal, the two uh, building blocks of uh, elementary emotions, uh, can actually be uh, accessible in Joseph lab well. So in addition to all the cognitive studies uh, that we're doing right now. And I would say Drosophila, I consider it as a hydrogen model for social cognition. What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are on site at the beautiful Westlake University in Hangzhou, China. We are now going to be talking about the neural mechanisms of social cognition. We have Dr. Yi Soon joining us on the show. Hi, Yi. Hi. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Yeah. I'm very excited for this conversation. For those who don't know Yi's background, he's a neuroscientist, physical chemist, engineer, and professor at Westlake University, pioneering novel methods in functional brain imaging focusing on the neural mechanisms of social cognition. And you can find the links in the bio below. Yi, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions we like asking our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think the direction is moving towards information explosion. And I think part of the world is about the dynamics of information flow. So, a key question is how information are integrated. And those involve integration of information through, say, computers in the physical world, or information in our brain. And that's why I'm interested in the social brain. Information flows and the information flows. The dynamics of the information. The flow. dynamics of information flows. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and then specifically with, you know, especially biology has this social behavior between creatures that exactly. then yeah. enables information flows and to do specific objective functions like, right. yeah, like reproduction mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. uh, uh, gathering food and yeah. resources. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Go over here. There's a yeah. plenty of food over right. here. Foraging yeah. behavior. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And then we, as eight billion creatures, also have our uh, dynamics of information flow that enable us to say, "Well, maybe you should move to the city because there's more opportunity, there's more efficiency, yeah. Yeah. there's more wealth to be yeah. made." that type of stuff and we mm -hmm. tell these stories about people going to the city and mm -hmm. finding opportunity and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Do you do you frequently um, make these abstract leaps from uh, biological uh, communicative uh, processes for social cognition, which we're gonna dive really deep into and abstractly uh, metaphor, give metaphors for how we as a civilization of humans behave? Ah, that's a pretty tough question. Uh, so these days I'm generally concerned with, uh, um, you know, the internal representations and things like that in animal brains. How do we make m metaphors between um, abstract um, aspects of how a brain works uh, compared to the operations, information flow, things like that in the real world. Um, I think um, I think my study in the simple systems like uh, small brains, uh, like Joseph LeBlanc that we study, uh, eventually help us understand much more complicated real world um, world or human brains, things like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that that part to your research is probably the most interesting for me is once you uh, understand the neural mechanisms of social cognition and the 
uh, internal representation, then you can maybe begin to start abstracting up from a fruit fly to uh, the mammals uh, and uh, human, human brains, human brains yeah. and then all of a sudden we have a better understanding of how uh, we work and how our society works. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that's my favorite part. Yeah. And let's do, let's jump into your journey. So who, where were you born? Who were you as a kid growing up and how did you get interested in science? Um, I got interested in science uh, in the family because uh, when I was a kid, uh, my, pa my parents were, uh, were educators. Uh, then they gave me a lot of different toys to to play with. Importantly, they they gave me uh, they asked me to to create toys, and I can play with the toys that I created. Um, and through that process, I can uh, come up with things that I'm interested in, which are the toys and the technologies to build these toys. Uh, and I think that really uh, eventually led me uh, to my career in science and technology. Wow, and this was in the Jiangsu province. Yes, yeah, it's the Jiangsu province, clo very close to uh, Zhejiang's uh, province that we're living in now. So once you started making your own toys and tools and stuff, that kind of led you into your interest in engineering, and then that got you into that was at um, your bachelor's was at the School of Mechanical Engineering and Automation in Beijing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Right. Right. So walk us through going to um, doing your bachelor's and getting interested in engineering further and then also going, um, starting to get into your PhD. Let's start going on that track. Yeah, uh, that was a pretty long uh, journey. So I was originally interested in engineering because uh, I thought engineering was cool. Um, and actually, I still think engineering is very cool. So after graduation, I actually went to the industry. Um, I was working in uh, companies that were uh, producing information technologies, that was bring a lot of programming, and at a certain point, um, I realized that uh, it's it's very important to study um, instead of all mechanical things or, or like physical things. I want to get better understanding of ourselves. Uh, so I went to graduate school. Uh, I was uh, studying uh, things that have some connection with. Like building tools to help us better understand um, how we are, what we are, and how we do. Yeah. So that uh, was about my PhD. It was actually in physical chemistry. We were building nanotechnology uh, tools that eventually can help us to study uh, biological systems as one of the applications. Um, but by the end of my PhD study, uh, I became more and more interested in the brain. Uh, part of the reason was because we were, we were devising uh, technologies to record the activity from electrical activity. Uh, and one of the applications was, of course, to record from the activity of the brain cells. Uh, so from there, I became interested in, I started to read neuroscience papers and start to read neuroscience textbooks. And I went to neuroscience uh, courses. Um, and I find this is, wow, this is much more interesting than I wanted to study. Mm -hmm. uh, so eventually um, I uh, moved on to neuroscience and I, uh, I did a postdoc in Harris Medical Institute and then I was working as a research specialist there for about six years time. Uh, really uh, got me to dive into uh, understanding the brain and technologies for understanding the brain, of course. Yeah. It's interesting hearing about how you had this engineering uh, background that then was like, well, I want to know how life works. I want to know how the life works. And so that kind of gave you this really good footing for dissecting and diving deeper into biology with an engineering mindset. And then this fascination with reading brain cell activity and yeah, yeah, I like this a lot. Okay. And so then that would that PhD happened um, physical chemistry and nanotechnology at the National Center for Nanoscience and Technology at yeah. the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Exactly. And then you went to do this postdoc at Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which actually I was recently learning um, is just one of the most well-funded um, research yeah. institutes in the world. Yeah. And it's really cool that um, there's l lots of people actually from Westlake um, that got a chance to be there mm -hmm. and um, and do their research there. So let's start talking about that. So you were doing optical probes that report electrical activity through fluorescence. Yes. Okay, 
Let's walk us down what you were doing there and what that is. Uh, apparently, it's very important to record the activity of the brain. That's the way you really understand how the brain works, right? Uh, and one of the first technologies was to uh, record through electrical recordings. Uh, the very famous uh, patch clamp recording technology. Uh, they really uh, allow us to to uh, get a sense of the activity of individual cells um, at a very high temporal resolution, of course. Uh, the problem is the brain, the brain doesn't work uh, as individual cells. The brain works uh, as a neural network composed of many, many, actually millions, uh, billions of neurons, right? Uh, so really to understand how does the neural network generate activity patterns and eventually to behavior uh, we need to understand the activity of a population of cells simultaneously. And, and that requires technologies to recording not just one cell at a time, but many, many cells at a time. So that was uh, why we were looking for optical technology, because uh, for electric technology, uh, there are certain ways to record more than one cell, but those technologies uh, doesn't tell exactly which cell we're recording from. You could hear uh, the sound of many, many cells. It's like a cocktail party, but doesn't really tell which one is which. Uh, so we designed these probes, which are uh, built um, upon the fluorescence technology, the green fluorescent protein, which is a protein uh, that fluoresces uh, all the time. So we did some protein engineering so that the protein wouldn't fluoresce all the time. Instead, they fluoresce whenever there's neuroactivity. And the way we translate neuroactivity into the fluorescence is through calcium, because we know from other studies that uh, neuroactivity changes leads to calcium concentration changes within individual cells. So we designed probes that can detect calcium changes real time. Okay, so that really is two-step process. One is from electrical activity to calcium, the other one is from calcium to fluorescence changes, and mm -hmm. all happens mm -hmm. uh, with pretty high temporal resolution. And with the help of imaging technology, you can do that recording for many cells simultaneously. Yeah. Wow, okay, so from electrical activity to calcium changes, from calcium changes to fluorescence, right and then being able to image not only a single neuron, but a network of neurons that then give you an idea of behavior. Right. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, now, where else along the way to Westlake were you starting to think about this, pioneering these novel methods in functional brain imaging? What were you thinking of when you were at uh, Howard Hughes? What were you trying to uh, to understand a deeper level of these neural mechanisms, and then how did you end up transitioning to this uh, professorship here at Westlake? Yeah, so uh, when I was at uh, Howard Hughes, actually Virginia University campus, uh, I was interested in two things. One is the uh, optical probes for uh, recording the activity. Uh, the other one is about how we use these probes to really understand uh, the under the, the uh, operation of the brain. So th one of the things where I was really interested in is about uh, the selection process. Like we make selections, we make decisions all the time in our lives, right? So I was tr trying to understand this from some really simplified power line. So we were studying how the the fruit fly, just up from Melanogaster, uh, which is a great model system. Uh, because it's more accessible brain, but still a rich bar of behavior, how do they make decisions? So uh, I was using very simple visual stimulations and recording the activity in the brain using the probes uh, that we developed, uh, not just the green calcium indicator, uh, GCAM 6, GCAM 7, but also uh, red calcium indicator, say JARC Echo 1, JARC M1. When we were doing this simultaneous two color, two photon imaging so that we can record from different channels that are from different populations of neurons that are spatially intermingled. Uh, that tell us about the representations and the transformations of information of that representation in the brain that eventually lead us to uh, lead, lead the 
the, the flight to make the decision to uh, say uh, dedicate engage in a specific object uh, amount of uh, out of uh, out of several yeah uh, so that was uh, the study I was studying in a simplified paradigm and I wanted to study this decision making process in more uh, natural realistic uh, paradigm the scenario and I, I think the ultimate uh, natural situation is our society right because we all live in a society we have to make decisions we make choices all the time in our society um, and I think Joseph is still a great model system and at that time Westlake was establishing um, it was actually uh, it was um, still under active construction. Um, so uh, I have experience of working in newly established institutions. Uh, I got my PhD from uh, Nano Science and Technology, National Center for Nano Science and Technology, uh, which was established about uh, a little over 10 years ago. Uh, and that was also the time when uh, Geneva Research Campus of Howard Hughes Medical Institute was established in, uh, in Ashburn, Virginia, in the in suburban area of D.C. Uh, and I, I, I think I have a great experience working uh, in those uh, newly established institutions uh, because of the excitement uh, and the fair on the campus. Uh, and that was one of the driving forces why I was choosing Westlake uh, out of other uh, places. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, the magic of all of the different departments here that are coming together to push the ed frontiers of science. Right, the interdisciplinary environment here. Yeah. Uh, it's a small but still highly uh, diversified institution. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, so the focus now is on neural mechanisms of social cognition, internal representation. Mm -hmm. Internal representation has a couple subsections, behavior, anatomy, imaging. Start walking us through what this is. Yeah, so, so the way we study uh, the uh, neuromechanism of social behavior, uh, first we have to have behavior paradigms that help us to dissect uh, specific aspects, to basically define the questions, right? To translate behavior, which is you know, highly variable, into very specific questions you can address with technology, with, with tools in neuroscience, and that's about behavior. Uh, so we have paradigms that are uh, involving free behaving flies. The flies are afraid to do whatever they want to do, and from there we record their behavior, record their uh, all aspects of the behavior, their sound, their motion, and we do a lot of analysis, and from there we get uh, a specific uh, perspective. We find, we find clues about how they make decisions, how, how they learn from each other, say, um, and how do they recognize each other. Uh, and from there, uh, we do more controlled uh, behavior experiments. Uh, those more controlled behavior experiments would tell us something about how they perceive others. And that really a hallmarks of uh, or indications of internal representations in their brain. To get at the internal representations in the brain, we, we first need to get a picture, a static picture of the brain, because we first need to know the basics. Uh, like if you want to understand the behavior of Hangzhou, we know about the dynamics of the traffic, we first need to know about uh, the roads, right? It's the network of roads in Hangzhou, before mm -hmm. we, we, we dive into the dynamics of the traffic. Mm -hmm. so, uh, in a similar way, we, we, we first need to get an anatomical basis with the static pictures of the brain before uh, we get to the more dynamic aspect, which is about uh, the physiology. So there we apply the technology, the optical probes uh, that we developed early on uh, to record the activity of the brain. Uh, we, we try to do all these experiments um, in one animal. So the animal is, you know, doing specific um, behavior task and then record their activity. And from there we can find the neural correlates of internal representations that are kind of modeling their perception of others. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's continue this example where we have uh, uh, the Drosophila, the fruit fly that is in a, in a um, you guys have chambers, yeah. right? So let's explain these um, these chambers. So you you are doing things like watching it with a camera, mm -hmm. and you're recording that data, yeah. yeah. And you're also recording the audio yeah. of the yeah. fruit fly. Yes. Okay. And then you are also then having another fruit fly mm -hmm. join it. Yeah. Okay. And then you're observing how they interact. Yeah, yes. So we have two fruit flies just like we have on this couch, two humans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a camera watching us, just mm -hmm. like there would be a camera right, watching right, fruit flies. Right. And then there's a recording right, of the audio. Right, perfect analogy, yeah. Uh, the audio yeah, happening. Yeah, yeah. And so, now what are the fruit flies saying to each other? Mm -hmm. uh, w what are they talking about? Yeah. Um, and how do you make neural correlates mm -hmm. of specific audio yeah. frequencies and wavelengths and mm -hmm. et cetera? Mm -hmm. to what they could yeah, be talking yeah, yeah. about. It's yeah. a very good question. So uh, our communication is a response to specific situations, right? So we say specific things because we want to deliver a specific message to, to change the situation. Say, uh, we sit here uh, and I say hello because we want to make better connections, right? Uh, so the, the, the approach we, we study this problem is to uh, to categorize recordings, the, 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 the patterns of the sound, and then we find the context where specific types of communication of uh, of patterns are uh, generated, right? Uh, so you see what I mean? So we first record the uh, the, the audio of the flies. And then we categorize into different types for, because first we need to know what they're communicating, and then the second question is how, the, why they're communicating that. They communicating that responds to specific context because, say, another fly was giving them a negative or positive information, or there's something we they need to communicate about the environment. Uh, so we um, we take out the specific timestamps of specific types. Of communication pattern, and then we study through the videos and audios uh, about the context, and we try to see if there is a correlation between the context and the specific patterns of communication. Yes, yes, that's okay. how we understand what the messages are actually being delivered. Because, you know, we record the sound, we can only know the physical, the acoustic property of the pattern, but we don't know exactly what the message, what the meanings of those communications are, right? Mm -hmm. we, we try to deliver, we try to understand, derive the meanings uh, by looking at the context, the, the recent history. Mm -hmm. Yes. So then we do something like we take the Right. We start. We we start in a sense building out an a library of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the yeah, different yeah, yeah. Uh, audio recordings mm -hmm. and video uh, analogs mm -hmm. to those audios. Yeah, yeah. So now I have a library, mm -hmm. and there's type A, type C, type Q. Yeah. Audio recording. Library or dictionary. Or dictionary. Yeah, we have a yeah, dictionary. I like that. Okay. Okay, so there's this library or dictionary happening, and then then there's a, an audio and a video component that goes to every type in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then now you've built out a catalog. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this catalog is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how do you then say, let's map type A 
to specific neural activity or type D to neural activity mm -hmm. so we can understand what social cognitive processes are. Happening. Right, right. So uh, that's about how we move you know, free behaving animals to more restrict tethered uh, preparations where you know, the fly is either flying or it's walking on a ball, um, but it's restricted, it's hat fixed. Uh, it's important to have fixation because we can do physiology, we can do uh, calcium imaging, right? Using the optical probes we developed to look at their brain. And then we try to uh, simulate the environment uh, that we just discovered, right? So from the behavior studies I mentioned uh, before, uh, we know the context of specific patterns. So we try to replay the context and then we look at the activity of the brain. So we try to see what was going on, what were the interrepresentations for the context, and then what are the interrepresentations that are predictive of the patterns of sound that they're going to deliver. So it's very important that we study the behavior and physiology at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you're doing a couple things. You have a, a chamber for the fruit flies where you're doing in, where you're doing video and audio recordings mm -hmm. in a free moving space and yeah. you enter in second fruit flies do you ever enter in third and fourth fruit flies how many at most do you guys look uh, at? I mean the power lines how many total fruit flies do you let hang out in the chamber to see what happens with their group dynamics oh uh, we have collective behavior is composed of many many flies Oh, so cool. we have a whole range of different studies from two flies to many, many flies. So there's a dictionary for two flies, there's uh -huh. a dictionary for three, four, five. I think the dictionary for two flies is probably kind of uh, general for uh, arbitrary numbers of communications. Yeah. Uh, we don't know yet. Yeah, yeah. Although there are interesting dynamics that change when when uh, the there's number a third person right. in this conversation, right, right. or a fourth person, exactly, exactly. then the four-person conversation could break into two two-person mm -hmm, conversations. Mm -hmm. you know, and that very... two-person combination could change over time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sorry, exactly. Sorry. They'll, yeah. they'll start talking to the mm -hmm, other two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay so, okay, so there's a chamber one that's happening, and then there's also this, you call it uh, partial tethering. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the let's talk about the anatomy of the fruit fly mm -hmm. yeah it's very important yes. to to uh, so I actually skip the anatomy part because uh, it seems like after studying the behavior we go directly to physiology which is not really true uh, so after studying behavior we basically have no idea what's going on in the brain so I have to know the neural substrate uh, of specific behavior uh, because not all the brain is used for all the behavior uh, so we do some uh, behavior genetic study to find potential uh, candidate uh, circuits for specific behavior. And then we use anatomical approaches, uh, which you can call it neural circuit study, whatever, connectome, things like that, to understand a, a static picture of the brain uh, that probably underlying this behavior. Yes. So with the anatomy, we're doing things like, let's see this visual brain, then right, so thorax, yeah, which is connected to the six legs mm -hmm. and the two wings, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you tether it specifically to the thorax mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to make it so that the fruit fly in a sense can still mm. move on this ball mm. so this is again this is different than the chamber mm -hmm. um, so it can move on this ball mm -hmm. but that the brain it's not moving so so much that you can't properly image the brain over time mm -hmm. in space mm -hmm. so it's enabling you to give a and this is where I wanted to also um, ask you before we used to just take a dead piece of mm -hmm. brain tissue and mm -hmm. image it mm -hmm. and now we're keeping the brain tissue in the organism while it's mm -hmm. alive while yeah, it's yeah. tethered and yeah. imaging it so it's giving us a more real understanding of social cognition rather than just 
yeah, a dead piece of tissue. Right, right. Yeah, so the early studies was about, uh, about the brain, uh, basically neurophysiology was done uh, to a large extent on dissected brains. Uh, actually, uh, people uh, also do culture, uh, culture neurons, dissociated culture neurons uh, for cellular mechanism. Um, so those studies are great for studying uh, a lot of molecular and some of the synaptic physiologies, uh, but they're very difficult to, uh, to recapitulate uh, the actual environment the animals are engaged in. Um, and also, um, when it's dissected, a lot of connections are, are cut, right? So the, the, the physiological state of the, of the brain is, uh, is different. Uh, we don't know exactly how different they are. Uh, so people moved from dissected brains to in vivo studies where people anesthetize the animal so that there's no movement. Uh, it's very important to get rid of the movement because movement are detrimental for a lot of physiological studies, say physiology, electrophysiology or imaging. Um, but still the animal is not in a normal uh, physiological state. Anesthetize is, is not a normal physiological state. Uh, so people start to do awake but not behaving. So they, people try to tether the animal as much as possible. The animal is awake and we can do the recordings but uh, we don't know exactly uh, the animal is thinking about, right? They could be daydreaming about whatever uh, they're daydreaming about. Um, so uh, after that, we start to do um, physiology in behaving animals, tether behaving animals. Yeah. So that really give us uh, a a context to study the dynamics of the brain because the animal is attending to very specific uh, features in the environment and they're processing uh, those features in the environment and they're generating specific behavior. So we can look at the dynamics of the brain when the behavior results are cracked and we can also compare those two when the behavior effects are wrong. So that really tell us about how does the brain solve the problems that animals are are, are trying to figure out, yeah. Okay, so where does this dictionary or library catalog that we were talking about before with audio and video representations of social behavior, how does that begin to uh, be related to when you have the second, these second experiments that we're talking about where the fruit fly is tethered and it's on the ball and um, then you have a couple other very interesting additions to the uh, experiment happening. You have a, uh, a, a, vir a virtual reality that the fruit fly is basically mm -hmm. in with, mm -hmm. a, with a, um, a, a display that is, con if the fruit fly moves on the ball, the display changes. Mm -hmm. And so it gives a, you know, a false representation of, of, uh, of uh, of control of, of, it, of it actually being in a, in a fake environment. And, um, and then how does then the fruit fly on that, in that tethered secondary environment, how does that give you when you're actually looking for these, these neural correlates and you're doing the microscopy on the brain, um, how does, it then in that environment have the relations to that first environment where you were doing the catalogs of audio and video and uh, and social behavior. Yeah. So so the first one is more about uh, in a more natural context. Um, we try to sample through the possibility space of the communication, the voca uh, vocabulary, uh, the dictionary of the fly. Uh, and from there, we pick some of the things that we think are more interesting, some of the specific patterns of communication that are critical for specific behavior. Say, uh, they try to deliver a message like, a male fly saying to a female fly, I love you, or a male fly saying to another fe male fly that I hate you. 
uh, we take those pieces and we focus on those pieces and we try to uh, devise stimulations that tell us more about the details of that communication and how, does, how are those uh, decisions like love or hate uh, made uh, in the brain. Uh, so, so this is a much more controlled experiment that we do on tethered uh, behavior. So the first one uh, is about generating hypotheses and, and finding, and, and finding uh, all kinds of phenomenology. And the second one is to specifically look at the mechanism for a few critically important, uh, some of the most important uh, key points during social communication and social interactions. Okay, so if in the chamber you see a an interaction that is that you can run uh, pattern recognition on a lot of people are using AI for these types of purposes they're looking at tons and tons of image or tons and tons of audio and they're finding okay here's a pattern to a specific thing in our dictionary to type yeah. a yeah we hypothesize that that could be an I love you let's mm -hmm. say okay a mating call of mm -hmm. sorts mm -hmm. okay for mm -hmm. reproduction uh, and maybe that can even be better seen by if they decide to have sex afterward, mm. the fruit fly sex mm -hmm. afterward. Mm -hmm. Then yeah. you're like, okay, that was probably, I love you. That yeah. was probably, yeah. let's yeah. reproduce. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, so then, um, then when you take it into the second environment, um, you want to then uh, do some sort of simulated I love you um, to be able to then map what's happening in the brain during that uh, I love you. So um, maybe it's like uh, optogenetic stimulation mm -hmm. uh, for the fruit fly mm -hmm. where it can be simulated mm -hmm. for that fruit fly that, oh, it's that, it's that uh, I love you. Um, mm -hmm. And then you're mapping what's happening in the neural architecture on the, in that. Yeah, that's one of the things we do. We uh, use optogenetics to activate or silence specific populations of neurons that give us clues about or give us controls over the state of the animal. Uh, but we also deliver carefully designed quantitative stimulations, visual stimulations, auditory stimulations, things like that. Uh, and we look at, we quantitatively record uh, measure the activity of the brain. We try to build correlations between those sensory stimulations and the neural activity, and we try to see uh, at which stage what are the representations for those sensory inputs, and what are the transformations between different stages of representations, and how those sensory the percepts are gradually. Uh, transformed into uh, categories that facilitates decision making. Yeah. Uh, so, so we look at uh, so important aspect of this is that everything is quantitative. Uh, so actually, the first stage of free behaving uh, behavior we talked about early on, uh, it's also uh, involves a lot of quantitative analysis about uh, the videos, the actions, the movement of the animals and the audios, the communications, the sound uh, of the animals. We have to do uh, analysis, and some of the analysis are done online so that we can have closed-loop feedback, um, real-time feedback. Yeah. What would you say uh, are the most uh, common uh, social um, cognitive uh, communications happening between fruit flies like if you had to say that there were certain uh things that were being communicated in the dictionary or in this catalog what are the most popular types of communication that they're happening is courtship. it courtship 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 yeah courtship yeah. is the most yeah. frequent communication because like reproduction is just like top priority mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's probably uh the same across many many different species so funny like yeah courtship is a 
because you can yeah, do yeah. foraging, you can yeah. find food on your own, but you cannot reproduce on your own, on right? your own. For, for higher order uh, animals. It's impossible, right? I guess in a sense, like a fruit fly can just, yeah, reproduce and then maybe can not necessarily maybe have to care so much about its offspring. Like, oh, am I financially stable enough? Do I have enough food uh, to support my offspring? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a little bit more just like, I'm just going to have offspring a lot and just uh, not necessarily have to worry about if there's going to be... <laughs> enough food, food for the offsprings, for the offsprings yeah. and just kind of let them yeah go what would be a second most popular communication that's happening uh fighting i think fighting yeah so wow. um so between males uh, male to male and female to female as well um they they fight they fight for food they fight for mates they fight for a lot of things, yeah. Uh, but the fighting is uh, much more dynamic than courtship. And it's actually, compared to courtship, it's pretty rare. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's sort of graded, like they, they don't burst into fierce fighting immediately. Uh, there's a building up process, yeah. There's a building up with courtship too. Right. Uh, there's a yeah. There's a building up of courtship. It seems like courtship is m more more robust. Yeah. Yeah. There's courtship between males as well. Okay. So there's obviously a lot of uh, biological uh, um, uh, hierarchy of importance of prioritization happening across different species. Humans, fruit flies. Doesn't matter what species. There's always this kind of like hierarchy of priorities. Mm -hmm. And 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 for m a lot of the time, it's just like reproduction is a big one. Mm. Um, but if a fruit fly has a limited lifespan, then it needs to prioritize reproduction. Whereas we have an 80 year lifespan, we can yeah. reproduce in a longer window mm. in the mid part of our mm -hmm. lives or early yeah. mid part. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, uh, okay, let's talk about when this, the, the most common behavior is courtship. So uh, what visual, and auditory signal processing are you doing that is able to say, oh, look, the male and female are about to, you know, how can you predict like courtship from, for happening with like an audio signal or a video? Uh, right, so, so when they starting to show signs of engagement, they're first they orient to each other. The male will be oriented towards specific females. Uh, so basically the attention of the male will be uh, directed towards the female and then start to uh, catch up with it, try to start to chase the female uh, and the female would just uh, flee uh, and then they try to they keep doing this uh, chasing game and if the female uh, is interested in the male uh, the female will slow down at a certain stage so become receptive to the male give the male an opportunity then the male will start to sing the song. Then the female will make a decision if she likes the song, she, she likes the song of the male and she's ready to, to accept the male and uh, she will, you know, just come to a stop and, uh, and eventually uh, they will engage in courtship, uh, copulation. And, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's, a, it's a pretty uh, wow. dy dynamic process. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, there's a lot of video, yeah. uh, uh, visual and acoustic uh, communications yeah. uh, during this process. Interesting. So yeah. orientation first, mm -hmm. and then chasing, chasing. Yeah. And then and attempt to copulation. Uh, but the song, yeah. the song, the singing. Was, yes, that singing. was very interesting. Yeah. The singing. Yeah. Wow. So, it, how do you guys know it's like singing? Uh, it's, it's pretty obvious, uh, you can record the sound, and it's very uh, typical, it's, it's called pulse sound. So the pulse sounds are uh, a strongly indicative of a courtship process. 
Wow. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you literally singing, and yeah. then the females deciding whether or not the song was good enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. And then copulation. Right. And then offspring. Yeah. How quickly uh, do they end up, like? Like, do they end up staying together, or mm-hmm. do they end up going and reproducing with others? Uh, uh, they 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 will do the latter. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Diversify. Just of, uh, is, is not uh, monogamous uh, uh, animal. Yeah. yeah. The Drosophila is not monogamous, and it's just constantly trying to swirl its genes mm-hmm. with other. Uh, genes instead mm-hmm. of just the specific genetic code. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think yeah. I think in in, in birds um, and some of the other higher order species, you will see monogamy, social monogamy, or sexual monogamy uh, more frequently. Yeah, yeah. Well, because there's also a completely different uh, dynamic biological dynamicism to that process where mm-hmm. you have a us which has to like raise a child for mm-hmm. such a long period of time mm-hmm. um, and uh, we can't just like birth the child and then go and like try and swirl our genes with other um, mm-hmm. of our same species because mm-hmm. that child can't just go off and try and find food itself it has to be raised and yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's different timelines. There's mm-hmm. different. Um, there's so many other factors that go into this. Okay, mm-hmm. well. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's very important that uh, we try to uh, study the various factors that get into the decisions uh, during social interactions, uh, and try to see how does the brain weigh different factors, and eventually, uh, you know. Um, make a choice uh, to uh, dedicate to a specific uh, decision. Yeah. Yeah. So the information integration and decision making are some of the some of the scientific questions that we're terribly interested in at the moment. Likewise, yeah. I'm so fascinated yeah. by that. That loops us all the way to the, what you were saying at the beginning. So I'm constantly taking in my environment and I'm figuring out, you know, I have like a ledger of my environment and my internal ledger and I'm mm-hmm. constantly trying to figure out like, you know, if my stomach ledger is low, maybe I'm going to change my environmental mm-hmm. ledger so I'm closer to food so yep, I can yep. get food. Yep. And um, I like this a lot, this like dynamic game of, of, uh, of well, okay, if my internal ledger is like, it's, I'm getting closer to the age of 35, maybe it's more and more important for me to find a mate to reproduce with. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's so interesting that you guys ended up identifying um, these um, neural mechanisms and internal representations of a courtship to be the most like common. And now you're stu- so studying courtship is the la- is your lab's most uh, worthy of well, what you're actually uh, we're um, specific interest in social cognition. Uh, there's a community of scientists that are interested in the biological basis, neural basis of social behavior like courtship, aggression itself. Uh, and in addition, on top of that, there are cognitive control during courtship and aggression. Uh, say there's attention, there's memory, there's decision making, uh, all those things, there's learning uh, during those very dynamic social behavior, social interactions. And my lab is specifically interested in the cognitive aspects of social behavior. So uh, we, we don't uh, focus on uh, the, fun, the, the basic uh, social interactions, the hot-wired circuits of social behavior. We're interested in the dynamics, in the modulation, uh, in the cognitive aspects mm-hmm. uh, during social interaction. Okay, so how do you then replay? How do you simulate a male? Do you like literally put up on the screen like the female fruit fly and then the male fruit fly when you're doing? We, the we, we part? do we do uh, a whole range of stimulations from realistic physical uh, flies um, of different uh, state different states, and we also do simulated more controlled uh, or computer simulated stimulations yeah for the other flies so so 
simulations that then stimulate the neural activity so that you can map correlates right. of so social cognition. Right, right. Okay. And you're what, like, what, I guess, what areas of the uh, neural architecture of the Drosophila do you see um, most engaged with courtship? Uh, well, at this stage, I would say pretty much, uh, you know, many, many parts of the central brain is engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, there are indications for many, many uh, different types of neurons. Uh, but we're still lacking a, a big picture about how different parts of the brain interact with each other to generate coherent behaviors during courtship and aggression. Um, and specifically, uh, the, uh, the flexible, the cognitive aspect of the behavior, um, we still don't know exactly uh, what is the neural mechanisms for that. And that's something that uh, my lab uh, is mm -hmm. particularly interested in. Looking yeah. for the neural mechanisms of courtship and aggression. And other social interactions. And other social interactions. Yes. Okay. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Right. Okay. So basically, uh, the courtship, the social behavior of flies are not stereotyped. Not as stereotyped as we thought. Uh, there's a, quite a bit of flexibility. Like, flies do make choices between, say, different potential mates. Yes. And and the uh, aggression process, the fighting process, is also highly dynamic. It's, it's not something that is very reflexive. Yeah. So that's something that, that's the kind of behavior that we're particularly interested in. And your method for that is where we're really interested in. Okay, so it, would it be something like the neural mechanisms of me uh, looking at, um, uh, potential mate number one and potential mate number two and then me like looking at them and trying to figure out what um, the dynamic activity in the brain of like is that one a better mate right now or is that one mm -hmm. a better mate right yeah. now yeah okay and like how I switch between those two yeah like w what neural activity is lighting up what in that decision-making process mm -hmm. yeah what kind of circuit architecture support that yeah and then it could potentially extrapolate up to our own brains when we exactly, ourselves... Exactly, exactly, yeah. So it's very important that... So the reason we study Josefla, which is entirely different from ourself, uh, people will wonder why we study social cognition in such an entirely different species. The reason is because it's a much more accessible, tractable model system. So from these studies, we can know the circuit architecture and the activity patterns that generate the behavior of say attention, of say memory or decision making, learning, things like that. And these knowledges can actually directly translate into algorithms that help us to design more intelligent systems directly. We don't have to we don't have to study the human brain to, to do that. We can learn from any kinds of biological model system and Joseph Law, I would say is probably the most convenient system that we have access to at the moment. At the same time the results that we learned, uh, the principle that we learned from this simple model system will help us to understand much more complicated system because if we look at the history of biology we we'll see uh, a lot of these fundamental principles were actually in the molecular level were actually discovered in single cell uh, model organs such as E. coli, yeast, things like that. And if you look more, even more broadly across the entire um, scientific field say physics, uh, the quantum mechanics, we, we spend most of the effort to study hydrogen, right? We use hydrogen model as the model for a lot of studies in quantum mechanics. So that's the basics of, you know, the whole architecture of quantum mechanics. And I would say Drosophila, I consider it as a hydrogen model for social cognition. Ah, ah okay, okay. I like that. Especially with the long time scale of biological evolution and just how neural, the neurology, the, ner the nervous system inside of creatures has been developing for such a long time, there is almost inevitably going to be um, correlates in the nervous system across, spe across species. Especially since in the hierarchy of, of decision making, like reproduction is 
is it a hundred percent common across like pretty much almost every species has to have reproduction in its hierarchy mm -hmm. and likely the top thing in its hierarchy along with um, food foraging like mm. uh, yeah, yeah 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 so then it's very possible that when you look at like how a fruit fly is determining like mate number one versus mate number two and like switching between those to find out which one it could almost kind of be like when a woman or a man is looking at potential mates themselves as well and like switching like what architecture in the brain is lighting up and um also what uh just like a male has a song that is played um in a sense you know we have our songs that are played with our uh like our like online profiles of ourselves like when someone looks at our online profile in a sense it's a song that's being played to them about who we are our uh, our work our 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 you know our travel or our interests or whatever and then also we have these little micro songs that are played in terms of like when we meet each other in person or when we send each other messages or emails or um, you can add little smiley faces or little winky faces or little uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> all different types of, of nuance to our social mm -hmm. communication mm -hmm. that um, can then be uh, related in some way to um, people deciding whether or not we are a good mate to reproduce with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, emotion comes together is cognitive process. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's a very important part of social study, social cognition as well. So when we talk about cognition, it's not just limited to uh, classic definition of cognition. It also includes uh, emotion. Uh, even though uh, the emotion in fly is a uh, little bit elusive compared to emotion in higher order species, but the flies do uh, display some elementary, uh, some uh, you know very simple forms of emotion, uh, like like or dislike. Mm -hmm. uh, the likes and dislikes, some of them are innate, some of them are learned, uh, and these responses uh, are generally considered as uh, valences, which is, you know, according to some theories, is one of the building blocks of emotion. Yeah. Yeah. So flies do have valences. Yeah. They have avoidance and approach. Yeah. And uh, those things can be studied in flies as well. Yeah. That's a very, very primordial uh, look yeah. at it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, at emotion, like or dislike. Yeah. Go towards or go away from. Right. Yeah. Flies also have another aspect of the emotion, uh, which is about arousal. So, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, some of their, some of the flies can be highly aroused. Some of them can be more like calm, uh, and those things, uh, we do have a lot of behavioral evidence for that. And those things uh, can be studied in Joseph as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So valence and arousal, the two uh, building blocks of uh, elementary emotions. Uh, can actually be uh, accessible in Joseph Lab well. So in addition to all the cognitive studies uh, that we're doing right now. Throughout this conversation, I'm just frequently just trying to see how uh, your analysis of the Drosophila is related to uh, my like ideas about how those potentially those uh, neural correlates to um, uh, human behavior. And uh, my mind has just been racing about how is it possible that we also do these courtships or these aggressions or these emotions, these like or dislikes, um, and how can we start saying, this is hard because how many um, neurons again are in the 100,000, right? In the yeah, 100,000, Brian, that's oh, our okay. uh, rough estimation at the moment. 100,000 neurons in the Drosophila, about 70 to 80 million in the rodent, in the mm -hmm. mouse, mm -hmm. and then 80 billion or yeah. more yeah. in uh, yeah. human yeah. brain. And we maybe think that it's possible that uh, a circuitry of like or dislike, something as simple as that, mm. could have 
even though it may only be a network of like a thousand or a couple thousand neurons mm -hmm. in the drosophila, yeah. Yeah. there could be an analog to like or dislike of maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands in the mm -hmm. human brain. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 So I'm just like, this research is so cool. Um, and there's obviously um, great importance to um, this also this catalog like if there's a, a literally like a type a social interaction that leads towards like higher success in courtship mm -hmm. and you can like watch that through video and hear it in audio like there's a like there's a specific song style mm -hmm. um, that leads to greater success in courtship, mm -hmm. then you can simulate that song style mm -hmm. um, to when the um, Drosophila is tethered and then watch as the neural activity um, is- Ebb and flow, yeah. Yeah, maybe towards, maybe mm -hmm. towards a higher um, propensity for mm -hmm. um, desire for copulation. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, and then we can maybe say that there is a possibility that that same thing exists when when like a female identifies a human female identifies a human male that is maybe uh, a little bit higher up on the hierarchy maybe has a little bit more financial success or has advanced a career in a certain degree there's maybe a greater amount of of desire for uh, mating with that than if the male is lower on the hierarchy and so you can maybe map a neural a correlate um, of a greater amount of activation that happens. Um, yeah. I'm so fascinated with this subject. This is such an interesting one. Okay, so let's, um, let's have you explain also the, um, um, the overall like um, differences in um, communication modalities can you list them um one more time for us you're doing um visual, visual auditory, auditory sensory. somatosensory meaning like touch touch yeah so we didn't talk about this one too much but so the fruit flies also come up and right they do touch each they other. do touch each other yeah, yeah. yeah. shake hands they, they do they shake they, they shake, do shake hands no way right. with their little insect legs exactly they exactly. do shake hands yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. wow what mm-hmm yeah. But if there's but if there's um, uh, friendship, there's or a courtship, mm -hmm. they will like do a little like handshake, literally like a yeah like they a do. leg shake. Yeah, they do. Yeah, insect leg shake. Exactly. Yeah. What? Yeah. That's this so is very frequently happens. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. okay, visual, auditory, somatosensory. Mm -hmm. There's also olfaction and. Uh, gustation. Uh, we don't specifically study those things. Okay, but there is smell, olfactory, S smell and taste, and taste. Yes. Which you call ju just just a gustation. A gustation. Yeah. Gustation. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Okay. Okay. So we we have these sensory modalities as well. Yeah. We yeah 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And so these are basic sensory modalities that have been evolutionary conserved across many many different yeah. species. And it's very important that we study uh, information integration in the central brain. So uh, my lab doesn't study, say, uh, visual processing and periphery uh, visual processing, say, in the retina, uh, which is optic lobe in the fly brain, or periphery auditory or olfactory uh, processing. I, I, we don't study that. We just study the, the higher order processing in the central brain, especially information integration and decision-making, things like that, yeah. A main uh, takeaway, it seems like, from this conversation is also that um, it's important to, in a sense, humble ourselves with how many different um, modalities of communication we use, visual, auditory, somatosensory, olfactory, et cetera, with us uh, and then how basically out of the 10 million species on the planet that there's also different modalities of communication between all of those species and 
with specific hierarchies of decision making involved in why they're communicating in those specific ways. And so uh, it's basically this massive uh, open uh, uh, catalog that we have yet to really investigate into that you're at the frontier of investigating into and you're doing it with one species the Drosophila. Mm-hmm. And there's so many other species. Of course, mm-hmm. the Drosophila is one of the best um, scientific species for us to investigate. Model system. The model system. A model system, yeah. like the zebrafish and yeah. the rodents are exactly. model systems. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. They're like little like gifts of nature, like little yeah, hacks yeah. that yeah. make it easier for us to... Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's easier because there's a, a community of genetics uh, study uh, for more than 100 years for Morgan time um, that really allow us to dissect the nervous system of the brain of a already relatively simple brain uh, almost one cell at a time. So this is really unparalleled in any other species say uh, zebrafish or rodents because you don't have such a great uh, Raptovar of genetic tools. Yeah. Yeah, the once you have like the entire cell lineage um, of an animal mm-hmm. and also the um, or an insect and then also the um, entire uh, connectome of the um, of the yeah, nervous system. Right. Yeah. Then it becomes a model, a more mm-hmm. of a model. And also mm-hmm. it has high transgenic abilities, mm-hmm. um, it yeah, has yeah. high reproduction rates, yeah. all this type exactly. of stuff which yeah. make it yeah. um Another thing that I think is really important for you to teach about um, is that, you know, a lot of people are wondering, okay, like, if you're going to be recording all of this video, all of this audio, all of the somatosensory um, interactions, trying to make catalogs of all of them, it's obviously a tremendous amount of data. Mm -hmm. Um, You're probably trying to store like petabytes of data Mm -hmm. of fruit fly interactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Um, and then yes, yes. So and then all. So the question is, how do you, how do you, how do you in your lab affect like if most effectively store that data, um, and uh, most effectively analyze that data? So you have to do all this digital signal processing of like audio and you know video. 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 So how do you guys do that part? Yeah, we use the latest tools from machine learning to do uh, video analysis, audio analysis. We invest a lot on the hardware uh, infrastructure, uh, computational storage infrastructure, uh, and uh, many of the graduate students actually come from engineering backgrounds, say computer science, electrical engineering, things like that. So uh, really, uh, the way the modern neuroscience, system neuroscience um, is, is studied um, takes a shape that's slightly different from uh, traditional microbiology. Uh, uh, so neuroscience, system neuroscience really focuses on information processing. Is it like assigning variables to different fruit flies? Right, so, so let's make it easy. Fruit fly A, yeah. B, C yeah. in the chamber. Yeah. B, at a very specific time stamp, makes an audio transmission mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. fruit fly C. Yeah. Is that how you're approximately? Right. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly what we do. So uh, we try to record the videos and audio simultaneously, and then we do the uh, uh, analysis and we do the synchronization so that we know at each specific time, what are the states for specific flies? So, uh, so among the different flies in the chamber, say one, we pick one of the flies as a fly of interest, and we, by doing this analysis, we know all the sensory information, uh, the context, the social context that are available to this fly of interest, right? And that's what the brain is about to process. And if we get the statistical uh, signature uh, of that state and we can try to recapitulate that statistical structure uh, with tethered with more uh, mm-hmm. controlled um, program stimulation so we can gen- generate hypothesis wow by doing that yeah. 
Okay, so I observe um, fruit fly B uh, making an audio transmission to fruit fly C, and then you record that exact um, transmission, and then uh, maybe you also saw that that transmission was the song, and then B approached C and C slowed down, enabling um, B and C to go through a copulation process. Maybe then you take um, uh, one of those two fruit flies into the tethered environment, and then you and then you re uh, you simulate what um, you initially uh, logged as that process uh, if, of B making a song. Maybe you take C into the tethered environment and you simulate B's audio stream, and then see how C's neural architecture responds. Mm -hmm. And then that's maybe yeah. what you're trying to develop right, is right. these correlates. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay, and there's 10 people right now in the lab. -ish. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. And all of the 10 in the lab are analyzing their own data, building their own data analysis tools. Right, basically, yes. Yeah, which is really cool. I thought when you were teaching me this, I was like, that's a pretty good way to run the lab. So. Um, everyone's kind of gaining the, um, this experience of knowing how to do the data analysis, mm -hmm. which is such an important part is, right. is doing that. That way they can all go and also um, do their own experiments more easily mm -hmm. in the future. And right. yeah, you're training people really well. Um, yes, that's, yeah. uh, that's the idea. Yeah. yeah. And then um, will, you, will you tell us what's available from your lab? Like if other people from around the world are interested in collaborating with you, um, what parts of your um, techniques are available for like non-commercial use? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have any specific commercial interest at the moment. Uh, we uh, develop and use tools for behavior, for anatomy and for physiology. Uh, including functional imaging and electrophysiology and uh, many of those tools actually are available um, yeah, for, for other people, especially for people over here on Drostop, of course. So then scientists that are using, um, that are trying to study for non-commercial purposes mm -hmm. um, are able to get in touch to potentially Right, we also some, distribute, yeah. say, uh, transgenic flies, uh, reagents for recording the activity, say the GCAM, the GC, say GCAM 7 flies. We distribute it across uh, many, many uh, places. People get that uh, prior to publication, actually. Yeah. Okay, so your GCAM 7 is what you have to, you have to transgenically add GCAM 7. And right. that enables... We modify the genome of the fly, yes. make the transgenic flies that express uh, JGCAM7. Modify the genetics of the fruit flies so that they express GCAM7, which enables um, the, the uh, electrical activity to fluoresce yeah. for when you image it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. through genetics, we can do that for very specific neurons, say one or two neurons in the brain. We can do that with uh, as little as just one or two of the neurons right. out of the 100,000 right. to fluoresce. Right. Yeah, that's really great. Okay, yeah. so you can distribute that so people can um, ask for those. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, cool, okay, okay. What would be your ideal neuroscience tool of the future, maybe like 50 or 100 years down the line? Um, what would be an ideal tool that would let you um, do the reading of the whole connectome, do the um, manipulation to the connectome, like what would be an ideal neuroscience tool for you? Uh, yeah, I think along the line of functional imaging, there's a lot more to do uh, in terms of uh, the spatial and temporal resolution and the spatial and temporal scale. Uh, so calcium imaging, the JGCAM7 series allow us to do recordings across many cells, a pretty high resolution across a pretty long time, but that's not enough. Uh, we want you to go into, say, more than one kilohertz uh, a second in terms of temporal resolution. We want to record from every cell, ideally from every branch of the dendrite uh, in, across the brain. And we want to do that, say, across the entire life of the animal. Um, so that's uh, the ideal tool. I mean, that probably is not just one tool. It's probably a whole combination of 
tools, including uh, optical uh, instrumentations, including uh, the, uh, the molecular tools, the, the probes, and including uh, technologies for uh, data analysis. Yeah, I think those are uh, well, I would like to see in, say, uh, one or two decades later. Yeah. yeah. How do you think we can inspire more people around the world to work together? Ooh. Um, education, I think. Um, I think the um, people across the world they come from very different cultural backgrounds. Um, religious background um, and uh, there's a lot of barriers um, between different groups of people um, but there are also some uh, general principles general beliefs uh, that are held by uh, everyone in the world and those things can be educated and people could be educated and understand to realize that actually people from an entirely uh, different background uh, actually, they, they have a lot more in common um, than they thought. I think this is a message uh, that should be delivered, uh, you know, probably by the mass media uh, than what they're doing now, yeah. which is more emphasis about the differences Agreed. between different communities. Yeah. yeah, I like that answer a lot. What do you think is a skill that young people should know? as we go into the exponential technology age? The skill. Uh, there's a whole lot of different skill. Uh, I wouldn't uh, emphasize specific skill, skill over others. Uh, but I do believe that information technology is something that are critically important uh, for next uh, next generations, uh, as you know, this is a most rapidly developing, one of the most rapidly developing yeah. directions. Yeah. And information technology, I would consider near science, system near science is a part of this, oh, yeah. um, this direction of information explosion. Yeah. What would you say is the meaning of life, this big human experiment that's happening? The meaning of life, um, yeah, how to make sense of the world and to make sense of ourselves. Uh, I think that's probably the meaning of life. I like that answer, yeah. Making sense of our reality and our uh, selves. selves. Yeah, I like that a lot. What do you think is the role of love in our world? Um, so, well, love is like glue, right? Uh, it's kind of sticking, uh, putting things together. Like well, you, your first question about um, how people across the world could collaborate more. Um, and love is an important ingredient um, because, um, you know, love, as we say, is actually part of the emotional system, right? Yeah. Uh, so it can modulate the brain and modulate our behavior in a way uh, that uh, in the absence of love uh, would be entirely different. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that this is a simulation? Uh, which one? Our reality. Um, depends on the definition of reality and simulation. You know, for a neuroscientist, uh, we do virtual reality all the time. We trick the animal to um, believe uh, what actually are uh, not reality, uh, virtual reality. Uh, so I think it really is just about information processing, information in the brain, information in the outside. We perceive the outside world through simulations in our brain. So you can say simulation is reality, and reality is simulation. Mm. And last question is, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? The brain is the most beautiful thing in the world. And the societies that are composed of the brains, if you, the, the, the one that comes after, yeah. And why? It, it's just amazing. Um, no reason. I love it.
I love it. This has been so mind expanding. E, thank you very much for coming over to our show. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Holy cow. Uh, wow, everyone, thank you very much for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about the neural mechanisms of social cognition, about all of these different things that you was teaching us. Reporting electroactivity through fluorescence, pioneering novel methods in functional brain imaging, optimizing ways of imaging physiology, the neural mechanism of social cognition in general, internal representations, and the different communication modalities for biology. Just really think about this, these topics more and have more conversation with your friends about them. Check out the links in the bio below to Yee's work in Westlake University. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in, support simulations. We continue doing cool things like coming on site to Westlake University in China and interviewing great professors and principal investigators like Yi. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. Wow. Thank you. Oh my gosh, ah. so mind-blowing. <laughs> yeah, you oh. asked a lot of uh, tough questions that I wasn't prepared at all. <laughs> <laughs>